Philippians chapter 4, we're going to dive right into the text, beginning with verse 1. Paul writing to the church in Philippi, Therefore, <clears throat> my beloved and longed for brethren, my crown, joy, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore Euodia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. As we mentioned last Sunday, one of the themes that Paul segues to as he works his way to the close of this letter is the basis for Christian unity. Not only should the reality of God's grace and the indwelling of God's spirit and our laying hold of Jesus fill a person with a supernatural joy, but these things should also, as a secondary byproduct, yield an unbreakable commonality, a common bond among the brethren. That no matter what might divide us, God's grace and his spirit and the common pursuit of forgetting those things and reaching forward to Jesus, that should be all we need to get along with one another. The simple fact that we all possess, presently possess, a citizenship in heaven, as Paul wrote at the end of chapter 3, that alone should be more than enough to cause each of us to stand fast in the Lord with one another. Sadly, though, it would appear that such a reality had been lost on two ladies within this Philippian church, who, it appears, were at odds. Though Paul is vague on the specific, the source of the contention, in, quote, imploring Euodia and in Syntyche to be of the same mind, Paul is affirming that there was a problem. A problem existed. Doesn't tell us what it was, doesn't mention the source of contention, but there was a sticking point with these two ladies. It's clear Paul was even grieved. He was grieved by this situation because both, according to the text, Euodia and Syntyche, Paul says, had labored with him in the gospel. These were his friends. Now, whether it had been Paul's time, the original time he spent in Philippi, Acts chapter 16, or even possibly his ministry in Thessalonica or Corinth, these two women... Paul says, labored beside him, alongside of him. They strived together with Paul for the sake of the gospel. They were co-ministers. Aside from this, Paul also affirms that their names were contained in what he calls the book of life. Now, this is the first mention of this book in Scripture. But it will again be mentioned seven times in the book of Revelation. Most notably, we're told in Revelation 20, verse 15, that anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Case in point, this book, it's a book you want your name in. Now understand, Paul was upset. He was moved. When he heard that Euodia and Syntyche had this falling out, and he was moved because these were two godly women. They loved Jesus. They were both his dear friends. They had co-labored in the ministry with Paul. We can also determine that they were likely influential members of this Philippian church. This situation, this disagreement, was so critical that Paul decides to make his appeal to these two women, not privately, but publicly. Now, before we continue, I do want to point out that it seems that whatever the issue these two women were fighting about, it would seem that the issue at hand didn't present a real obvious right or wrong side of the argument. Like, I think it's safe to assume that if the contention with Euodia and Syntyche had been a blatant slight by one or the other, or some type of indiscretion, Paul would have been more specific. Case in point, go to 1 Corinthians. Paul has no problems when he sees an issue calling it the issue that it is, but it doesn't seem that this particular matter rose to that standard. It it was probably more a contention based on personalities and personal preferences. I think it's also important to note that Paul does something very wise. 
You notice that he refuses to take sides. Like he doesn't get in the midst of the minutia of this disagreement. In light of all of the things that he's been writing in this letter to this church, what does Paul do? What's his strategy? He simply implores them or he's begging with them. He's calling them to himself, encouraging them to be of the same mind. After discussing their heavenly calling, Paul pleads with these ladies to lay aside whatever temporal disagreement they were dealing with in order to stand fast in Jesus. As opposed to taking the bait and appearing to side with one lady or the other, Paul wisely chooses to instead point both women back to their common purpose, their call and mission, their calling, their calling in Christ. And note, he doesn't just implore one woman as opposed to the other. Do you notice the word implored you twice? He implored Euodia and he implored Syntyche. He goes above and beyond, not to show any type of partiality. In a sense, what Paul's asking is he's asking, was the, was the issue they were dealing with really that big, that uh, momentous, that they would break fellowship with one another? And in the process, foster disunity within the church community. Like whatever the disagreement, the one good thing we can say about this situation is that it would also appear that neither of these ladies had broken fellowship with the larger church community. Because this was the case, Paul was able to encourage this unnamed true companion along with this man Clement, which we know nothing about, but we can assume these men were leaders to, quote, help these women come to a point of reconciliation. Understand, when the issue of contention, of of disagreement, when the issue is a matter of what's right and what's wrong, and, and Scripture makes it clear, the church, along with her leadership, do possess a biblical responsibility to take a stand for what is right, even if it offends the, the, the opposing party. The scriptures are clear to this fact. And yet, when the issue is nothing more than matters involving personalities and preferences, you know, there's a lot we can learn about Paul's example. You know, the reality is that I take great encouragement knowing that this church in Philippi dealt with these type of things. The first church in Jerusalem dealt with these type of things. When you get a collection of people that are moving from sin into righteousness, a group of people whose one commonality is God's grace, but aside from that, man, there's a lot that would separate us. When you're trying to get a group of of misfits to work together, there's going to be tension and sometimes infighting. And yet the way that Paul deals with this I think it's brilliant, and I think that very quickly there's, there's some things we can learn. First, resist the urge or the natural compulsion to take a side. If the issue is not one of right and wrong, sin and righteousness, if it's just personalities and pre- don't take a side, resist that urge. Two, knowing what's at stake, I think it's also important that you're willing to help in the process of reconciliation. If you see two friends that are quarreling about a personal disagreement, be willing to help, knowing what's at stake. And thirdly, I think it's wise. If you do help, if you do choose to get involved, seek to move beyond whatever specific issue is there fostering division by pointing both parties instead to the common ground that they share in Jesus. Don't get into the spat. Don't get into the dispute. Help them by pointing them to Jesus. We're walking together. Not only does Paul refuse to mention the specifics, you notice that he doesn't even present or try to solve the problem. He just implores them to be of the same mind. And if you happen to be a Euodia or a Syntyche, and you're having a fight or a disagreement, with a brother or a sister in church, 
Can I just for a minute encourage you to take a step back from the source of contention and ask yourself this very simple question? I, I think if we did this, so many, so many problems would, would solve themselves. But ask, ask yourself, is the matter really worth losing the relationship over? I think it's, I think it's a tragedy to see relationships disintegrate over an issue that is trivial that the issue doesn't rise up to the value of that, of that relationship, the benefits of that relationship. Friend, know this. You can work to resolve the situation now. Even allowing the church to help mediate. Or you can run from that, that situation and then let Jesus address it once you get to heaven. Because guess what? We're all going to be in heaven together. If we can't figure out how to get along now, Jesus will make sure we figure out how to get along there. And so why not deal with these things now as opposed to having Jesus deal with them once we get to heaven? The choice really is ours. Now, once again, Paul, here he's, he's wrapping up this section as he's done with almost every section with this common encouragement, this, this command that everyone involved, from these two women, to the church leadership, to Clement, to the true Clement, everyone involved, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And then to add emphasis, he writes, again, I will say rejoice. Famed British preacher Charles Spurgeon, he correctly said, quote, joy in the Lord is the cure for all arguments. And I think that's so true. It's sad when we allow petty disagreements to rob us of a lasting relationship that we can have with one another. After discussing joy and its relation to our Christian unity, Paul now turns the page one final time to another component of our joy. A joy, I'll remind, that's based in God's grace and the indwelling of God's spirit. He's gonna point to one final component joy should yield. Friend, grace. Grace yielding joy always produces an inner peace. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, Paul writes, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And from love, what's yielded? Joy, next on the list, and peace. Peace with God, offered through the grace of God, will naturally produce in your life the peace of God, in addition to supernatural joy. Think of joy and peace as the twin children of God's love. And it's because joy and peace are twins. Twin children of God's love is demonstrated through God's grace. These two, joy and peace, they're tied to the hip. They're specifically intertwined. Think of it like this. When there is joy what will you find? On the same playground, running with joy, you're going to find peace. And where there is peace, there resides joy. They're intertwined. They're connected. You can't have one without the other. It's because this is the case. It's also true that when our joy comes under assault, our peace ends up being affected. And when we struggle with our peace, our ability to experience joy is subsequently undermined as well. This seems very obvious, right? From a practical standpoint, where there's joy, there's peace. Where there's peace, there's joy. When one comes under attack, the other feels it. This is why Paul spends the final pen strokes of his letter exhorting you and I to five specific attributes, knowing that they will safeguard your peace and therefore your joy in the Lord. First, look at verse five. Paul writes, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. For starters, this word gentleness, it's, it's really misleading. As a matter of fact, the King James Version translates this word as moderation. But in Titus 3 verse 2, the same word's written as peaceable. In the Greek, the word means equitable or fair. And the truth is that there's really not a good English translation. The best way to understand 
what Paul means through this word is to kind of understand the attributes that it contrasts. Instead of striving with man, or possessing a prickly demeanor, or being difficult to get along with, or off-putting, or having an argumentative or quarrelsome spirit, Paul is encouraging these believers, in contrast to those things, to possess a, for lack of a better word, a yieldedness, a willingness to relent and to submit, to just simply get along. In light of the fact that Paul says, the Lord is at hand, which would probably be better translated as the Lord has everything in his hands. Paul is saying, go with the flow. Like, go with the flow. As opposed to being the type of person that's always pushing the envelope or swimming against the tide or cutting against the grain. If the matter doesn't challenge one's ethics or morals or offends one's conscience before the Lord, Paul is saying, in such case, just roll with it. Like, always know that greater peace and deeper joy is found when you're willing to adopt a blessed flexibility. Sometimes we're too rigid. We need it to be our way. Pastor Chuck Smith, who started Calvary Chapel, uh, he had his own proverb, not a proverb of scripture, but just a proverb that if you spent any time around him, you would have heard. He'd say, blessed are the flexible, for they won't be broken. And there's a lot of truth to that as it pertains to our peace and our joy. If you can roll with it, roll with it. Verse six, secondly, Paul says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be, na- be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Aside from this blessed flexibility, gentleness, being essential, to safeguarding your peace and joy, Paul here is also commanding. It's a directive. He's saying, be anxious for nothing. In the Greek, this word that we have translated as anxious, it means to be troubled with cares. Like the word describes a person who's, who's constantly crippled, paralyzed with worry. Literally, Paul is saying, stop worrying. That's what he means when he says, be anxious for nothing. Stop worrying. Stop it. Stop it. But, well, stop. Stop worrying. Now, knowing that that's difficult, right? And and knowing that the, the, the difficult nature of this particular directive, Paul continues, look at it. He adds, but in, in place of your worry, in everything, what does he say? Let your requests be made known to God. Now keep in mind, Paul isn't saying that worry in and of itself is a bad thing or a sign of some type of spiritual problem or a lack of faith. If we didn't deal naturally with anxiety, there would be no reason for Paul to write this. Instead, what Paul is saying is that it's what you do with your worry that will ultimately enable peace and joy or yield fear and greater anxiety. Paul says, the practical remedy to these cares is to take them to the Lord, he writes, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Now, please note that Paul is not, his intention is not to be, like to present a formula. He's not, he's not giving you a formula. He's not presenting three individual things, prayers and supplications and thanksgivings that you can do aimed at three specific types of worries. It's not what's happening here. What Paul is, is doing in kind of the organic flow of his, of his letter is he's just encouraging you and I to communicate these worries to God, to just bring them before the Lord. Like he's describing something that's just organic, something that's natural, prayers and supplications and thanksgivings. And note, I love this. According to this text, there's no limitation to the things that you you can bring before the Lord. Paul writes, look at it. In everything by prayer. You know that word everything in the Greek, how it would be better translated? 
everything. Like, it's actually pretty accurate. Everything. Everything. The subject of prayer is whatever's on your heart. There's not a formula. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, which if, if it's not a verse you, you haven't committed to memory, I encourage you to. But Peter, the aged apostle towards the end of his life, he, he gives the church this bit of sage wisdom. He says, cast all your care upon him. Why? For he cares for you. Well, okay, Pastor Zach, seriously. Like, I just don't understand. How is prayer... How is prayer going to lessen my stress? Or how is taking these things to the Lord going to relieve my genuine anxieties? Zach, I am worried, and I have cause to be worried about my finances, or the the, the state of my retirement, or the stock market. I am really worried about my job security, or my moronic children. I'm worried about the future, and this mole on my back. I'm worried about the tension in the Middle East, the upcoming midterms. You can run quite a list of things you're worrying about. So how is taking these things to the Lord, praying about these, how is it going to relieve my stress? Now, aside from the fact that, that Paul is saying that the Lord wants you to bring any of these things to him, If you're really concerned about the midterm elections, pray about it. Or that mole on your back, take it to the Lord in everything by prayer. Pray about it. I could also add to it though, right? You know, it would be a truth that the act of bringing such cares to the Lord will remind you of of Jesus' love, right? Like like taking things to the Lord will, will remind you that he's in control of your life. I mean, Romans 8, 28, it's a promise. We know that all things work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are called called according to his purposes. Additionally, I could also say that incorporating such a discipline, taking your cares to the Lord in prayer, will help you keep in the forefront of your mind the amazing reality that God has promised to take care of all your needs. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. If God so clothes the grass of the field, will he not much more clothe you? For your heavenly Father knows that that you need all these things. But you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry, Jesus says, about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. You see, I can point to prayer as being a way to remind yourself that God loves you. That God is in control of your circumstances. And that God promises that he will take care of your needs. But you know what's interesting? (laughs) And Paul doesn't say any of that, does he? Like Paul doesn't say you need to pray in the place of worry to remind yourself that Jesus loves you and he's in control and his thoughts towards you are thoughts of uh, of not of evil, but of a future and a hope. He, He doesn't say any of this. You see, the amazing nature of this passage is that it describes for us a result that Paul promises will take place if you take your worries to the Lord in prayer. Look back again. Paul writes, let your requests be known to God. And then he doesn't say anything else about all the things that it will yield, but he says, and if you do that, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will Guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, he's saying that in the the presence of worry and anxiety, if you choose, if you make the decision to take these cares to the Lord in prayer, not one time, but over and over and over again, if you do that, God is promising in this passage that he will do something radical. Like, literally, God will take your anxiety and he will replace it with something incredible. The peace of God. That's the promise here. And and note, this is not peace with God or for that matter, some type of peace from God. 
This is the peace of God. Literally, it's the peace that God possesses, something that he shares. And while this supernatural peace is by definition foreign and otherworldly, it exists in God, not here. Paul adds that it will surpass or rise above even your cognitive ability to understand it. Most notably, this peace, Paul adds, it, it will do something for you. Paul says that it will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. In the original language, this word that we have, guard, it was primarily and really almost exclusively used as a military term. The implications of what Paul is saying is that God's peace will stand guard. It'll man the watchtowers and the walls, and it will prevent the invasion of foreign influences. Greater worry, greater anxieties, or doubt that will try to infiltrate in order to rob you of your joy. No, greater peace and deeper joy is found when you're first willing to adopt a blessed flexibility. And secondly, it's discovered when you take your anxieties and your worries and your fears, your fears to the Lord in prayer. Thirdly, verse 8, Paul says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the peace of God will be with you. Once again, in seeking to address these attributes that we need to adopt in order to safeguard our peace and our joy. Paul now transitions, I think in a very appropriate direction, to the substance of our thoughts. Now, while it's obviously true that you really don't have much control over the thoughts that pop into your head, the reality is you do absolutely have the ability to dictate what thoughts you choose to meditate on. It's not thoughts you think, it's thoughts you choose to dwell on. Martin Luther, the reformer, is famous for saying, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can totally stop it from nesting in your hair. And that's the truth. In order to safeguard this peace and joy, the joy that God has offered through his grace, Paul is saying it's important that you spend your time thinking about things that are true. You know, as opposed to marinating on fake news or falsehoods. We get so bent out of shape with things that aren't even based in reality. We need to think on things that are noble or literally honorable. Things that have honor as opposed to things that are crass. We should think on things that are just or righteous as opposed to dwelling on things that are wicked and sinful. We should spend our time thinking about things that are pure as opposed to things that are impure, things that are, are lovely or acceptable as opposed to the things that are filthy and unproductive. We should think about things that are of a good report, reputable, as opposed to things that are salacious in nature. Ultimately, Paul just kind of sums it up, and you get the feel that he could have just kept going. But he wraps it up. He says, he says, you should meditate on things that possess virtue or moral goodness and things that are praiseworthy or that are uplifting. Always know, greater peace and deeper joy is found when you first adopt a, a blessed flexibility, are willing to take your anxieties before the Lord in prayer, and thirdly, you spend your time meditating on things that are good and godly. Fourth, and we're going to read the next nine verses, Paul writes, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to 
be abased, and I know how to abound everywhere in all things. I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians, know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. As Paul approaches the, the end of his letter, he accomplishes here several things. In a practical sense, these verses read very much like a thank you note, don't they? Like Paul taking the, the final moments to just articulate again the thankfulness he possessed for the financial support that this Philippian church had sent via the, the courier here, Epaphroditus, Paul, and a Roman imprisonment, Philippi sending financial aid to care for his practical needs. He writes, look at the text again. He says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again or blossomed. Though you surely did care, he's making sure he's not questioning that, but just saying you lacked opportunity. It was hard to send money through the Roman Empire. It wasn't square cash. It was very difficult to get resources a thousand miles from Philippi to Rome. But Paul again reiterates, you've done well that you shared in my distress. Indeed, I have all and abound. And then he writes, he says, I'm full. Having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well pleasing to God. Now, aside from the present gift, Paul also here takes the time to commend them for their constant and continual generosity. Look back, he writes, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, or what he's saying, when he first arrived to Europe, when he first accepted the Macedonian call through that vision in Acts chapter 16, went to Europe, went to Philippi, started this, this ministry. He says, when I then departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you did. And then he says, for even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and twice to help me with my necessities. The church in Philippi was supporting Paul, not just when he was in Philippi financially, but even when he went to Thessalonica and he spent time ministering there, they were sending financial aid so Paul didn't have to work a job, but he could focus primarily on the ministry. And while there is no doubt that Paul is wanting to articulate his deep thankfulness for their financial gifts. You know, it's also evident, right? That Paul desired the opportunity. He seizes on the opportunity to emphasize here two more critical attributes necessary to safeguarding peace and joy. And if you're a note taker, you can jot them down. Contentment and generosity. Let's first just quickly look at contentment. Paul writes, he says, I have learned. I've learned. Like the, the word implies to learn by use, by practice, in whatever state I am, to be content or at peace with what one has. I know how to be abased or to possess nothing. I know how to abound, to possess much. Everywhere in all things I have learned through trial and error. I have learned to be full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer. You know, it really is amazing that Paul opens this section on contentment by writing, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Even for the Apostle Paul, contentment, regardless of present circumstance, the idea of being content was something that the Holy Spirit had to teach him. Even for Paul, it was something he had to learn. Contentment wasn't natural. It's learned. It's, it wasn't even for Paul theoretical. Paul lived it from personal experience. Paul had learned how to be content when he had little 
as well as when he had much. You know how true it is that contentment is the same struggle, whether you're poor or you're rich? You can have a ton of money. Contentment's still your issue. Why? Because you tend to want more. And when you're poor and you have nothing, you want money. It's hard to be content when you, when you don't have a buck. And yet, you still must be content. Don't detach Paul from his humanity here. Like learning anything. Anytime you learn something, it involves a process of moving from a lack of understanding to one of knowledge and experience. You now, to this point, there is no question that Philippians 4 verse 13 is one of the more famous verses in all of the Bible. And yet, I think it's one of the most taken out of context verses in all of the Bible. Keep in mind, look back, when Paul declares, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, the all things references back to the process of learning to be content when he had nothing or when he was experiencing a surplus. Like Jesus may not give you the strength to lift a car. It didn't give Tim Tebow the strength to throw a football and stay in the NFL. It's not going to give you the strength, nor is it a promise that you can accomplish some incredible strength or feat. What's actually being communicated, Paul's attesting in the context of contentment. I can be content when Jesus gives me the strength to be content. Paul is telling us that the strength to be content in whatever state you find yourself is only made possible through a specific working of Jesus in and through the individual. You know, in context, the verse should read, in Jesus' strength, I can be content in whatever state I presently find myself. Always know, Greater peace and deeper joy is found when you're first willing to adopt a blessed flexibility. Two, you're willing to take your anxieties to the Lord in prayer. Three, you spend your time meditating on good and godly things. Four, you learn to be content in all things. And now finally, you're willing to demonstrate a spirit of generosity. Keep in mind, Paul goes above and beyond to articulate to these Philippians that his thankfulness was not based in the fact that his needs had been met through their financial gift. Don't you kind of get that as you're reading through it? Paul's like, I'm so thankful that you sent you know, that gift, but I didn't really need it, but I'm so thankful you did. But man, I was good, I'm content. But man, it was so nice, but you know, uh, I, was, I was okay. Like the, the, as you read through it, there's this back and forth, isn't there? Where he's like, I need you to know I'm thankful. I just also need you to know I didn't need it, but I kind of needed it but I didn't really need it. You, you kind of, as you read through it, you get this back and forth of the Apostle Paul. He says, I'm thankful, but he, he makes it clear that his joy, Paul's joy was found not in the gift he received, but in how their generosity would be a blessing to them. That's what he took the most joy in. Paul makes several interesting statements in these verses. I'll just read them. He writes, you've done well that you share in my distress. Then he says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Then he says, God shall supply all your need according to the riches in glory by Jesus, implying that God would also take care of his needs. Like not only is Paul clear that generosity meant the work that God was doing through Paul's ministry would be attributed to their account. And don't miss that. Paul is making it clear that because the Philippians were financially supporting him, the results of his ministry would be attributed to their account. He's saying this very clearly, which is awesome. Because what this means is that there is an eternal value to your present generosity. Do you realize that? The truth, you can't take anything with you. That's the truth. But what's interesting is it seems you can send it ahead through your generosity. Paul, he says he was confident that their acceptable sacrifice, which was well-pleasing to God, 
would also be met how? With God's continued provision for their needs, right? Now, you might not get this from the text, but from a historical angle, the Philippians, you should understand, the Philippians were not wealthy. The Philippians were actually not giving out of their abundance or their affluence. The Philippians were giving instead in spite of their needs. In 2 Corinthians 8, this is what Paul writes. He says, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Who's he talking about? The Philippians. That in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we should receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. It would appear that the Philippians were sending money to Paul and Paul knowing their need was like, no, 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 no. You guys need this more than I do, but they were determined. No, 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 no. We're gonna give not just from our need, but above and beyond our need. And then Paul writing this letter is like, God, I am confident we'll take care of your needs. You see how the flow here is? You see, though the Philippians were giving from a place of personal want themselves, Paul was confident that God had it all covered. He says, he declares, it's it's emphatic. God shall supply all your needs. And notice from what source God will supply these these needs? According to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Though we may give from our poverty, the amazing thing is that God's blessings come from his affluence. They come from a much deeper well, a much larger account. He's able to meet your needs when you take into account heaven and glory. Beyond the fact these Philippians demonstrated that generosity is an attitude, an attitude that's independent of resources. Here is the lesson that you should take away from this. While godly giving does aim to meet the need that a receiver possesses, the truth is that giving generosity, it does way more to the person giving, not to the person receiving the gift. Yes, the church has bills that need to be met. But meeting those bills is not why you should give. You should give for one reason. God has called you to be a giver. And that's it. Like to a large extent, the issue of generosity, it's one of motivation. It's also one of obedience. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that. But it's also one of what's motivating the giving. Friend, you do not need to give because you have to give. You need to know that. You don't have to give a thing. There is no law mandating any type of gift. Nor are you to give because you want something from God. Which which we find a lot in the prosperity gospel, aka preachers on TV. You give, why? Why? so that God will give tenfold. That that's the motivation. You should give so that God can give more. That's actually a really warped way of thinking. Consider this real quick. You are already the recipient of all of God's blessings, right? Your paycheck, you are the recipient. It's all God's blessing. And you received it, right? Meaning, turning around as the recipient of God's blessings. To give, to then get more from God, or to give now with an agenda? We have a word to describe that. If you're the receiver and God gives and you receive and then you give so that you get more from the original giver, so that you can have, we actually call that greed. It's not a blessedness. It's greed. If you're giving so that you can get more from God who's already given, it's revealing that you're wanting more than what God has already given. 
And, that, and that's not right. You see, God's grace changes the way that we see everything, and, and giving is a prime example. You see, you should give because you want to, not because you have to or you want something from God in return. Since you are already the recipient of the blessing given by God, okay, godliness should then yield a natural desire to what? To do what God did give. God gives, you're the receiver. Godliness is now I want to be like God. I want to do what God did for me. God gave, I need to be Christ-like and then give. You see, you don't give to receive more. You received much so that you can now give like Christ, like Jesus gave. Understand, such a mentality. If you adopt this type of mentality, it radically alters your calculus. Instead of the debate being how much of your paycheck you should give away, the onus is now placed on how much you need to keep for yourself. It's a totally different way of thinking. This is why in contrast to the law, which mandated 10%, the New Testament gives zero numerical limitations to your giving because it assumes 10% probably isn't enough when you really understand God's grace. In 2 Corinthians 9, Paul wrote, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. Literally, he loves a giver who finds it hilarious. A hilarious giver. And God is able and, and notice the context. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Can we be honest for a moment and admit th that issues related to money end up being one of the largest deterrents to your joy and your peace? Like for proof of that, do you know that 57% that of divorced couples cite money as the primary reason the marriage fell apart. It's not adultery. It's money, the number one reason. And yet this is what makes generosity so important because it places something in check. In taking your paycheck and giving a percentage to your church, this is what you're doing. You're acknowledging that the entire paycheck was given to you by a God that loves you. You're giving a percentage away because that's actually Christ-like and the logical response to his grace. And you're trusting that God shall supply all your needs according to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. But this is what you're also doing. And I think it's important. You're telling your money that it doesn't have power or authority over you. Money is not your master. Friend, seeing your money as a tool to support the ministry of the gospel further the, and further the kingdom. It redefines its purpose and the act of giving it away reconstitutes your authority over it. The easiest way, if you struggle with money and it's robbing you of peace and joy, the easiest way to remove that power is to be generous and give it away. Matthew 6, Jesus said, Do not lay up for yourself treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasure in heaven where neither moss nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The final three verses as we seek to close. Verse 20, now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever, amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Always know, greater peace and deeper joy is found when you're first willing to adopt a blessed flexibility. It doesn't have to be your way or the highway. Second, you're willing to take your anxieties, your worries, these fears to the Lord in prayer. Three, you spend your time meditating on things that are good and godly. Four, you learn to be content in all things. And finally, you make a decision 
to demonstrate a spirit of generosity because, man, that's what Jesus did. In closing, Paul ends his letter with the very concept he began his letter, the grace of God. Do you notice that? As I mentioned in our intro study, Paul writes this letter because he wants these Philippian believers to know that because their joy was based in the amazing grace of God and not their present circumstances, they could truly rejoice in whatever situations they found themselves facing. The vertical peace discovered when one bases their spiritual life on God's grace enables that person unspeakable joy regardless of their horizontal environment. I've been asked recently, Zach, you know, for the last few years, everything you teach, literally everything, comes back to grace. Like, do you have anything else? Well, I'd like to answer that. If the Christian life begins and it ends with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and it's only because of this grace that we experience God's love, are filled with unspeakable joy, and are imparted a peace that would even surpass our own understanding, what other message should be preached but God's grace? As we've seen in this letter to the Philippians, Paul, writing from a Roman cell, unsure if he'd live or face a brutal execution, Paul was at peace. Why? because he was presently enjoying grace. And Father, it's with that.